Hello. Still got a couple more minutes before we get started, but I always like to sign on a little early. Make sure no chaos ensues. Happy Halloween. A day late. Uh, I hope everyone's two days late. Where are we at? Two days late. All the days are blending together, especially when there's no trick-or-treating. What's up, Steven? How are you, man? Alex, thanks for coming out. We'll get started in just a few more minutes. Seems like every time I start a little too early, people start rolling in. So if I don't start early, no one will roll in. Did you do everyone? Did you all, Stephen? Did you do all, uh, all thirty-one days? October is it's a beast. Hey, Jake. Thanks for coming out. All thirty-one, all Star Wars characters. That's awesome. That's incredible. And when we used to do them, I only had to do every other one. So that was like a super nice cheat. I only had to do 15 or 16. We would alternate to see who would have to go first. So one person would have to do an extra one. To do one every night, that's a lot. Oh my gosh, ballpoint pound, creepy clowns. All right, I gotta look these up afterwards. 31. I did the skull thing in July and that just, I mean, I I didn't think for a million years that I was gonna run out of ideas for skulls. And I didn't, but it was like, it was really getting close to the dry well. Yeah, that seems to be, falling behind on October seems to be part of the trend. Hey, Sleeping Dumplings, thanks for coming back up. All right, let's get rid of this screen. So the good news is, this guy still exists. I found him. I ended up, even though it crashed last week, which I still want to apologize profusely for, um, there was a, um, a backup file created, which you never know if those are actually gonna work. And very, very rarely am I ever actually able to take advantage of them. I'm usually so frustrated that I don't even go looking. And then uh, I went and I found the recovery file, checked it, and it was pretty much where we left off. So I was pretty stoked. Uh, that's a good idea. I, would, I think I used to do like thumbnails. I would do like thumbnails and then I would like sit down and like I think like two thirds into October doing the inks. I was pretty warmed up and I was pretty confident. But man, those first few, first ones at the beginning of the month, I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah, uh, now I just got, I just updated to the new Photoshop and the recovery feature and that is if you force quit and I can't make a, I can't guarantee that this will work every single time. But if you force quit on um, on the program, I guess it depends on what it's locked up on, but uh, I have a feeling it was more of a graphics card thing. But I force quit 
off the um, commit, not the command prompt, the, uh, the task manager. And when I reopened Photoshop, it opened up the recovery file. It even opened up the recovery file of that stupid sphere that I was trying to um, talk about light logic with. So it actually, it did multiple files. Uh, I opened them right back up. I actually don't know where it actually stores them. I believe it's in the temp drive on your C. Um, but yeah, that's pretty rocking. There was a time where I used to save automatically every five minutes because I used Maya so much and Maya was just the most unstable thing you'd ever, you could ever use. It's a lot more stable now, but, um, and I didn't like the auto saves because the auto saves would always like cause like hiccups in your workflow if you're working really fast. Uh, yeah, the 2021, I don't know if I love it yet. I haven't really put it through the paces. It doesn't seem all that different. Um, but yeah, I've heard a lot of people just really having a tough time with it. So that's that's a real bummer. What a big misstep for such a big program. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm doing the cloud. I, I use everything. I use Premiere, After Effects. Well, I don't use everything. I use Premiere, After Effects, Photoshop. What else do I use? I don't use Lightroom that much. I use this thing called um, ACDC, which is a pretty good file browsing. It's for photography. Dave turned me on to it, and I don't know. If, I don't know if it's awesome, but it's just what I'm used to using. So I use that. But Lightroom's pretty good. I use it with my wife's Neff's photos and things like that. But it's ex it gets expensive over time if you're not if you're not able to. Um, Pay for it. It's kind of daunting to think that they can just turn it off like electricity. All right, so I um, bridges always run poorly. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a good time with bridge. All right, so I'm going to jump back into this guy. One thing that I, as soon as I opened it, and then it's kind of a testament to like uh, getting fresh eyes on something. I want to make the eyes a little bit more orange. So. Just do a little twist to that. Just a little bit more red, a little darker. That'll give us a place to go. That way, like they can still be yellow, but the the glow of the eyes will come from the, um, will be yellow, and then it will kind of like turn towards orange. So okay, we're gonna jump back in. I really do. I mean, I really apologize for the crashes, but um, at least we can do this. So we're gonna finish up doing some mechanical stuff. We've got a little bit of leather. Um, not a lot of high chrome areas, so there's not gonna be a lot of that. Um, but the leather and the rubber, the metals, the sort of torn up metals, they're kind of fun. And then we'll do the we'll do the eye. And if there's time after that, um, if if it goes pretty quick, because I've got kind of the heavy lifting done at this point, uh, as far as the flatting goes. Um, then we can jump in the clip and I'll just sketch and we can talk shop and all that good stuff. So just to kind of recap where where, um, where we left off or what we were doing is I had I had run all the flatting up to about, I think it was about this point. And let's see, yep. So, um, so I had all my my flats laid in, and this is usually the stage. And and for anybody who hasn't seen this before, um, I always do my flats on separate layers. That way, if I need to make an adjustment, I can just go into that one layer. Um, and then I start weathering things. So for like the leather on the bag here, you know, we go. I have this kind of like mustardy color, uh, kind of like a tan color. Um, that I take kind of a, a chewed up brush and as well as the smooth brush and I just kind of go along the high edges and start introducing kind of cracks and things like that to kind of make it look like those like bomber jackets where like the leather when it folds it kind of starts cracking you can see it on these gray straps I've got some of it going on as well so that does a little bit of like nice storytelling to show the age on something. And then um, 
I've got a little bit of sooting that I'm just using. It's kind of like a, a warm gray that I, I kind of wiped in. I actually want to work on it a little bit more. Um, just looking at it. So I'm going to grab kind of like a, it's like a slightly noisy airbrush is what I'm going to start with. I'm just again working in the mask and I'm just going to drop the opacity down so I don't overtake it too much. And I'm just going to pretend that this is like soot that's um, kind of getting caught into the crevices of things. So wherever there's like a tighter joint, you know, like in, the, in here where like the crevices are. You can imagine like dirt has kind of caught in there and even even when it gets wet it's not getting rinsed out completely. So again just kind of using the storytelling idea of like where this guy's been, what he's doing. I'm gonna go a little I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that one. I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna do another one on top. That's just a little darker. So maybe like a imagine like a dark what what grease would look like. It has to be pretty dark. Set that to multiply. And then I'm gonna invert that. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna let some um, some grease drip out. So this is like a different bit of storytelling. This is like um, this thing has been sitting in a or being overused and some of the gaskets are starting to fail or maybe like whoever is maintaining it isn't doing such a hot job. Hey Casper, how you doing man? So we can imagine like a little drip coming out, a little pooling down the bottom here. It's usually off the rivets and it's and it finds its way like into crevices. I keep making that stuff happen. And I might move this layer above the rust layer because I have a feeling as soon as I turn the rust on that we did last week, it's gonna it's gonna be underneath it. I definitely want it to feel like the grease is happening on top of the entire surface. So I'll probably move it up a little bit so it rides in front of that. But you can imagine around the knuckles, there's a lot more grease going on. Drips here on his head. So we can do like a tear almost. That'd be kind of nice little bit of storytelling using the grease to make it look like he's crying. He's a sad robot. He's just he's out looking for a hug. All right. So just you can see like just like even just a few drips, and then you know I, I'll just wipe in a few kind of larger things. There's like this streaking that happens off of um, like rain on machinery where it's kind of like it shows the direction that the rain's been falling on something. You see it on sculptures. Definitely see it on like construction equipment. So just by kind of. You know, you follow the contours, and different levels of opacity, and uh, two percent doesn't do much, does it? And remember, like sometimes it, it, it for me, I, I like painting a little bit too heavy, and then I back it off because I am working on these different layers, and that just that just gives me a lot of freedom to. to see what I'm painting. Sometimes when you're trying to do subtle things and you can't see them, um, you just go a little heavier and then just and then just go back in and, and just kind of like lighten it up afterwards. So like these drips on his eyes, we can just t knock them back a little bit just by, you know, because I'm working in a mask, I can just switch between the black and the white and just kind of add and subtract until I'm, I'm happy with it. There we get some generalized drips going on. So you can see, like, I'm just gonna turn, like, it's when you just turn them on and off, it starts to add something. 
But like I said, I'm gonna probably have to move these up. So let's see, these were the secondary panels and then I have the rust. So the rust I did in two passes. So I did um, one mask where it was like hand painting and I did like a lot of the rust chunks. So like really deliberate areas, places that I knew that the rust would uh, accumulate. And then the second layer is just um, revealing more like as the paint is kind of getting a little bit more transparent, like it's starting to get, um, it's starting to get thinner in certain areas as it's kind of fading and degrading. So here's, I'm just moving up those grease layers so that they ride on top of the rust. And so yeah, we can, we can pretty quickly just see what it looks like with like almost no weathering and then what it looks like with the extra weathering on there. And it, it just goes a long way to kind of like start to really tell that story that we like to tell, which is this thing's been around for a while. All right, so I'm happy enough with those flats now that I'm gonna move on to my rendering stage. Um, so I add my solid white. This is just so that I can see the form or the line work a little bit better. And I'm gonna drop the transparency, excuse me, so I can see just a little bit of the underlying color. It gives me a Sometimes it just helps me realize if I can grab a selection off of my flat. Sometimes it just helps me kind of keep an eye on like what I'm actually rendering. Um, and then I'll create another folder group and I'm gonna create that, I'm gonna call that uh, shading. And inside that I'll put a solid color, something dark. My, uh, I've been shading a lot today. It seems like I'm in the mood to keep a little color in my shadows, even from the get-go, but because this is a live color, you can do this and change this to your blue in the face. So I'm gonna set that to multiply, but this this entire shading group, I'm gonna add the mask, the same mask that I created for the flats, and that will just isolate it around that character. And then I can use the mask on the actual solid color to do my, um, to reveal my mask painting. All right, so we'll set this back up to 100%. I just hit save. That's 15 minutes in, so every 10 or so minutes, I should probably remember to hit save. Will I? I don't know, it's hard to know. All right, let's, so step one, general lighting I pass, just to kind of get yourself a general idea of which direction the light is facing. I think we'll, we'll probably do something where He's a little bit, he's got the light kind of coming from the top right. And I think that that shadow color is just a little bit light just because I want it to be nice and I want it to be kind of rich um, so that I, it's clear, like just like when I'm painting, like I like to overdo it and then I can always back it off later. So I'm just gonna darken that a little bit. And it's just like really easy to see my shadow shapes as I'm working and then I definitely I'm gonna probably lighten this up. Um, and feel free to ask any questions along the way if there's something that I'm doing that you wanna know why I did it or have a better way of doing it. So now get into this. So I, I, I still like, even with me mechanical stuff, and actually sometimes even more with mechanical stuff, I like doing my selections when I'm painting. And it, it's, it sure is laborious to do, but it, I just, I really like the look. Like this is a really good example. Like the light is coming from the top right angle and the curvature of the robot's head is starting to, you know, go back into space, but then it kind of hits this kind of, um, like mohawk crest kind of thing. So I want a little bit of shading at the base of the crest. See, and I'm gonna drop my pressure sensitivity down a little bit. So that way it's a little bit broader of a stroke. And so I can, I have the, I still have it selected. I just have it um, turned off. And so just by having that selection, you get that really nice quick turn. But even that, I, 
I kind of back it out and then I can just invert the selection and because that form is starting to crest away I can that's probably a little too opaque the pass I can get a little bit of shading on the dome and I just I get that nice look of like you know, those forms are converging and that they're creating a little occlusion in there wonder how many times I'm going to hit the wrong thing. Okay. And then, and I do like to go ahead and cast my shadows as soon as possible as well, because um, I often will spend so much time painting on something that needs to be shaded, and then I'll cast a shadow over it, and. I, it basically I wasted my time because there was a shadow cast over the entire area and I didn't need to paint it. So like I'm going to cast the shadow over this eye. Now because I, because we're going to be illuminating the eye and the eye is made of glass and it doesn't really receive the same kind of shadow data as like an opaque form, I'm actually going to load my selection from the lights, which I have as a mask here. So I control click that and then I'm going to remove that from my shading data. So all the lights are going to be occluded from the mask. And that way, as I'm painting, I don't have to worry about any of the shading going into that. Hope that makes sense. Yeah, Photoshop's cooperating. But as soon as we start saying that stuff, you know what's going to happen. All right. So wires are kind of fun. I don't always do the full mask with these things because there's so many of them. But for the hero wires, I do some masking. So I do like to first do a quick pass on thing on small details as if they are not receiving any shadow data from other forms. So like I'm gonna do each one of these wires and this kind of goes in, contra in contrast to what I just said about um, laying in your forms first. No, I'm sorry, uh, not painting areas that are going to be covered with shadow, but I'm, I'm assuming that I, most of this is going to still be shown. It's my choice. So like these wires, I want to make sure have their volume added to them. But they don't have, they're not receiving any shadow data from objects that are riding in front of them yet. So that's going to be the next step. OK, so now all those wires have like a general kind of shading on them. And now I can say like, OK, this this like lens that his eye is made out of is casting a light over the beginnings of these wires. And this wire is casting a light down on this sort of ribbed wire. This one is casting. So then I can just start looking at like which one's in front, and that really starts to tell where these wires lie in space. Some of them get completely in shadow. That pushes them back. So even though in the line work it looks like they're pretty far forward, once you put them into shadow and you have another wire in front of it, it creates the illusion that they're behind it even though they you know scale wise they may look like they are much bigger and much further forward in the in the image. How do I hold my pen? This came up last week. It's a strange thing. I never really thought about it much until last week. I hold it like that. And then something that I think it was Casper um, made me realize that I'm doing is I have um, swapping between the black and white channel of the color picker mapped to the forward position of the button on the side of the pen. And I thought I kept my finger over the button the entire time, but I don't. I keep my thumb and my index finger flanking that button. And then every single time I want to hit the button, I just roll the pen into my thumb. So I'm actually, to click the button, I'm actually rolling the pen. That was a discovery we made last week. But now you know. All right.
most artists I know actually have pretty pretty nice grips. You know, they have like um, comfortable gripping. I have met some artists that have like really hilarious, you know, like like meat hand kind of holding the pen or um, uh, what's the other one? Like I I feel like that's like um, like what you would see in like etiquette class or something like that but then there's like this one right like you've seen people draw like this I think it's lefties do this a lot and they hold it like this and that that's always been really funny to me but you can draw like that it's not that funny <laughs> all right so like here's here's an interesting one like see I have this tooth down here and I have this little panel like right now it's flush right like they they're all following the same form but if I just I'm gonna use the shadow to change the angle for you so like just by casting the shadow off that sheet of metal that's above it and I cast it down at different angles it gives the illusion that now those teeth are kind of like converging and actually turning away from the camera and then if we were being like really sophisticated, and I don't, I don't, it's hard to see when I'm actually just painting, but ever so slightly, if you soften as the shadow moves away, then all of a sudden it's like the shadow's starting to blur out from the distance away from the light source. And that has a really nice bit of illusion as well. And then we can, on top of that, we can load a selection just for that tooth that sort of turns lightly away from the light and just ever so slightly darken it. And so when we back up, you can see like how much it just like all of a sudden like turns around. And then that's a nice thing to do on some of these metal parts as well is to just like load little selections here and ever so slightly just bend the metal. Just a little bit, just happy little bends. So it takes these like these sort of simple round forms and it just gives them a bit of interest like there's dents and creases and plane changes. Just like really subtle ones, but I, I really like them. I think I think it looks really nice. Um, where this panel is starting to bend over. You know, if I just darken that just a little bit like that, maybe just increase the crest there. Patty, this looks awesome, thanks. They have nice firm handshakes. Who does artists? <laughs> oh, the ones, the meat hands, yeah. Um, the claws on my right, on your ring finger? Callus is on your ring finger, let's see. I have the callus on the side of my middle finger. On the side of your ring finger? Oh, okay, so you're doing like the full grab. I see that. And then I can actually feel, just from doing it one time, how much extra pressure is put on that. Now, all the, all, actually, um, at the end of a day of drawing, like usually like when I end these streams, um, my, I've, I start pressing really hard on the pen and the blood, like actually you can kind of see how, how my fingers are, can you see how my fingers are bent right now? That's from pressing on the pen. That'll go away. But if I try and like open up my phone, there's like no blood or something in there. And so my phone doesn't recognize my fingers. First world problem. All right, let's get some of this. So we know all under here is in shadow. Dima. All right, I'm kind of getting away from where I'm supposed to be working. Okay, so like I just made a mistake. This happens to me all the time where I had already done that nice selection for that tooth and then I was sloppily blocking in some shadow data down here. So I'll use the smudge tool to kind of get myself out of trouble and just kind of move some of that shadow data down because again I'm just painting on the mask so I can just kind of scoot it out the way I make that mistake a lot or I'll, I'll work so hard and by so hard it let's let's be reasonable here it's not very hard um, but 
I'll work hard on a part and then I'll go to block something in later and I'll just be real sloppy and I'll cover the whole thing up and ruin it. It's nice. It's a nice feeling. Alright, let's do his earpiece. And I do kind of bounce around. Sometimes I'll work through the piece if I'm feeling in the mood to do that, but I do kind of like find sometimes like when I don't know how something's gonna look, sometimes like I know this is gonna cast a shadow on the main form of the face. So I want to lay that in um, sooner than later. Establish where that's going to be. And then you can see my, my selection was sloppy again. And this is another thing I can do. Like I, so now I can just kind of, I'm just going to fix those little errors right there just by scooting the paint over using the smudge tool. That doesn't always work. It's a lot easier than trying to get that exact gradient done again. All right. At this point, I'm making mistakes so often, I probably have to put the smudge tool on my on the other button on my pen. All right. So let's say one of those opportunities where I know I'm casting the shadow. So I'm just going to go ahead and knock that in now. That way, I don't spend any time rendering that area. And again, because the light is coming down over this area, across that, that light is going to start to um, radiate out. And we're going to, I'm, I'm imagining that there's a bit more atmosphere in this piece. So as, as the light moves away, it starts to get a little bit blurry. And that just kind of, that really helps set the distance. When a shadow is sharp, as you've seen, like if you're standing under a stoplight, uh, a traffic, uh, not traffic, uh, street light. Um, like where you're, you know, especially when you're stretched out down the street, as you move away from the light source, you're, you're getting blurrier. So that's kind of what we're emulating. I saw a dude at Comic-Con drawing their foot and they had two to three toes, some birth defects. So I guess more, moral to the story that doesn't matter. <laughs> Draw. No. Absolutely. That's off. I often wonder what I'm gonna do if I like, like I have like chainsaws and tons of wood shop tools and I like wonder like what my my first move is gonna be like once I cut my hand off finally, accidentally of course. Like what, what do I, what am I doing first and which appendage am I, am I choosing to, to replace my right hand? I know that's morbid, but I generally think about that often enough. Right, I already know I'm definitely starting with my left hand first. Right. So for like these dollops, I call them dollops. These little like, um, anytime I see like a screw shape head, like a dome or something like that, I render it like it's a sphere. So I usually fill it in and then I'll reverse back out like that. And then while I have it selected, I'll drop in this cast shadow for the inset and just ever so slightly wipe that out. So it's catching light on the other side. And I have the whole thing just isolated out. I think that's the fastest way to render something like that. I'll do it again on this thing. Now this is attached to another piece of metal, but because we're just going to edit that selection or edit that uh, connection to that other part in a second. But again, we'll just block it all the way in and then just kind of like reverse it out. Drop it to cast. Now this one, this one down here. It's already into the dark shadow, so the cast shadow that's coming off of it won't do much, but this one's still in a lighter area, so we want to make sure you cast a shadow off of that. And you're just kind of like maintaining that shadow story that we're telling, or like the direction. Uh, no, this is just for fun. This is just for the live stream, and then I'll, I'll post it to get my, my endorphin rush tomorrow so that, you know. Gotta make sure everybody likes you. Um, I don't know when I'm doing another art book. I did a I did an art book. 
I did a little uh, small kind of like ash can style one that's on my store right now for light box and there's a few left um, but I don't know what I'm doing another one they're fun to do I really like making books all right so then do the arch Did you get it? You got a con cool, concept goal? I really appreciate that, man. I always really, really appreciate any support you guys give me. I, uh, I love doing freelance, but every time I was every time I'm able to kind of make a few bucks doing doing my own thing, it just means I get to stay doing some creator controlled stuff a little bit longer. It's cool. So you guys are awesome for doing that. And because I grew up as a skater, I couldn't help but do all the stickers as well. I haven't done stickers. Let's see, when's the last time I did stickers? I haven't done stickers in like, oh, it's gonna be years, like a really long time. That was super fun. I, I don't know. Books books are always uh, tricky to, to plan, but right now there's no plans for it. Yeah, the monster volume sold out a long time ago. I have a few left in my, from my personal stash, but they're on Amazon. I mean, uh, let's see, I think uh, Stuart Ng gets monster volumes once in a while. Um, and then they show up on eBay. And people, if you if you really want a monster volume, they, um, put, they always end up on eBay. Like we sold them for 40 bucks and someone will try and list it for like 150 bucks. And it'll sit there for like a couple of weeks, probably get listed a couple of times. And then the person just gets frustrated and lists it for 40 bucks. And then you can get it for what it's supposed to be priced at. So if you just pay, if you really want one, just go on eBay and just be patient. Just watch the ones that get posted. And I watch them just because I'm curious. Like if any, if any of them ever sell for like $5,000, like I'm changing my entire business plan. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're, if it's something that you want to get a hold of, just, just follow the ones and then you get little notifications like when they get relisted and then eventually the price comes down. Sometimes people let you make offers. So you don't have to, you, you won't overpay for them. It's just, you just have to be patient sometimes. Uh, what's my favorite robot? Iron Giant is my favorite robot. That's an easy one. Iron Giant is my absolute favorite robot. Wally is my second favorite robot. And then my third favorite robot is, um, I don't even know what it's called, but the robot from, um, oh, what's the Ghibli robot? Why am I blanking? The, uh, is it Castle in the Sky? Did I say that right? I'm, I'm embarrassing myself. I'm actually going to buy them. I build um, plastic model kits in the winter time when it's cold. And then I just found out that they have a model kit of that robot. So I'm going to build that this winter. But that is part of my collection. So like this arch shadow that I'm doing here, you can see how that is. That That's a, um, when you do a shadow like that. So like basically what's happening is like the light is coming down. It's hitting the edge of that arch and it's hitting the one below it. And the light is close, the shapes are closest here and the light is getting um, the most, I'm, I'm sorry, the shortest distance between the, the, the ray here. But then as it comes further away, that is actually arcing. It, it creates an arc because the rays are actually get, having to travel further to get to the end of the next fin. So that shadow shape is what's, you can see again, like, here it's kind of flat. It could be it could be straight, whatever. But by using that curved shadow, I'm, I'm indicating that those um, those fins are kind of arc shaped. 
tricks. Fool in the eye. And it's not always accurate. It's just a matter of like doing it accurate enough where people believe it. That's the key. Trick them. See where I'm a little behind here. Hold on. What was my favorite robot? You inspire me to keep my line work and my oh good. Line work is my favorite. Line work is like like people's color palettes are um are really signature. Like people you know, like you can always if you are really into a person you can start to recognize their color concepts. But the line the line is like them the way that they sign their name, you know. So people who have really good line work, I just you know, I just fall in love with that stuff. Let it for the head. Put a little shading on the spring. Sometimes when I'm rendering this stuff, stuff like this, this little piece of me mechanism up here, technically it should have shading data, but because so much of the highlight is going to carry the, the the form, it's not really necessary to go nuts on it. Just because we have this guy and he's not overly complicated, I think. Do a little bit of everything. Uh, you did the Monster Volume Kickstarter. Awesome. That was forever ago. That was 10 years ago or more. Hmm. It's heartbreaking to think. $149. If I ever find out one of you guys paid $149 for that monster volume, I'm going to scream. Don't ever pay that much. It's not that good of a book. You have $149. You can buy so many art books at Stuart Ng. I'll get back into some selections here. Sure, you've gotten this. Okay, so Amanda wants to know, but for the robots, what types of references do you use? Do you try to make it look functional? I try to make it look functional. The, the so like you know like right here, um, I very purposely did these diagonals, which mimic the neck muscles, the sternos. I think they're called sternocleidomastoids. Sternal, sternal, cladomastoids. So that the mastoid processes. Um, Anyway, um, so I mimic those forms, um, add some rotation points in here so it looks like he could dip his head. There's some flexible paneling under here. These pistons look like they could compress and extra and push out. So I am trying to add believability, um, but do I care if it actually functions? Um, I only care if I have to hand it to a modeler. If it's designed to be an illustration, or if it's strictly going to stay 2D and that stuff is all going to be smoke and mirrors, um, it's fine. It's fine to just imply believability. Um, but when I do um, model for video games that they're going to put a lot of time into rigging, um, then it does need to be actually functional. And there is a lot of like, um, we used to do this in Ratchet and Clank all the time where we would add a lot of details, a lot of robotic pieces, but we don't but not all of them actually moved, right? Like, so like oftentimes we'd have like this really simple elbow joint, but then we'd have like all these pistons and hoses and things like that. And they weren't rigged to do anything else, but just do this simple joint. We wouldn't have any drivers or secondary joints or anything like that. Um, it, you know, if, if I could get an ambitious rigger, then I would absolutely ask them to add some functionality into secondary movements. But oftentimes it didn't matter. You'd never actually see that stuff unless it was like in a cinematic or something. So it depends on, it depends on the application. Um, and then a good way, most of the weapons that we did that were like unfold weapons um, for Ratchet and Clank um, and all the, all the robots, 
that had a lot of inter like we always tried to push the limitations of what could be done with robots and things like that mock them up in Maya or whatever 3d program um, you want to use just mock them up quick see if it's gonna work a lot of times you find quickly that like you know like something looks a little weird or something you know like landing gears and it often happens like you know it doesn't actually fit back up into the fuselage so it's good to actually test it out real quick but you don't have to like model it like it's going to be beautiful you're just modeling for dimension for distances and um so you can use almost any program for that it's not it's not like someone who has to know like how to model uh, a final character or anything like that you're just using it to do the basics but that's just the, that's one way of figuring out you could figure it out in paper i know like um there are people who lay things out on paper and cut them out which is hilarious but awesome I had to do uh, an origami character of a crow that folded up and so I just spent a bunch of time learning the origami folds of a crow and then I built a model of it and I, I built a model and cut all the folds into the paper and then um, rigged it and I actually was had been rigging enough things where like I actually rigged it well enough where the rigger just added the controls in and we were able to use it as was but it was funny to actually take something analog, measure it, and actually bring it in dimension by dimension, and then rig it, drop it into a game, and actually had folding origami crows. That was a strange week. And it was one of those things that I was so happy that I got working, and then nobody noticed it. <laughs> uh. I've been paying attention to you and Dave since 2008 and 9, I think. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we're old. Alright, so. That just about does it for the neck. So I'm softening this area here, this shadow that's going, that's sort of traipsing across here because I'm pretending that that is the head that's casting that shadow. So that needs to be really blurry because we want to show distance again. So we want to make sure that that's not a nice tight shadow. So those forms are pretty far apart from each other. So like this one right down here, that one has to be pretty blurry. Do I ever render? Uh, yeah, I do. Not often, not for myself. Again, I'm kind of a line weight nut. Um, but there's definitely pieces. A lot, a lot of times um, projects will come across that they can't have line work. I'm getting hired more and more these days to do it the way I, I like to draw. So like, because I'm posting, you know, this kind of drawing often um, the clients that are coming to me they are hiring me to you know make it look the way I like to draw which is important that's the that is I will say that is the, the best thing about like Instagram and stuff like that is if, if that's important to you that actually works pretty well um, but once in a while you come across a project that just sounds too you know it's too much fun to turn down but it's maybe not in the same style that you're used to working and if it requires painting without line, it requires painting without line. It's it's really alluring because it just has such a nice, you know, you, you don't have to get line weight correct. I, I think that's pretty great. Um, and if, you know, if you get a shape right, get a shape right. All right, so we're doing this thing where I'm like, I'm still imagining like the light is casting down. And then again, just a slight arc, just like a subtle arc to show that like that form is round. That arc goes away from it. We'll do the same thing on the one below it. 
Hattie's taking off. Everybody say goodbye to Hattie. Thanks for coming out, man. Cool. Yeah, if it comes out any decent, I'll post it up. If it doesn't, you'll never see it again. Amanda's saying, thank you. I do modeling in Maya. I'll play around with the robot making. Yeah, and don't go nuts. Like, honestly, like, um, if you get into the weeds too much with the, with the functionality of a robot in Maya, what I found is, like, I won't take, uh, I won't take chances with, hey, Sean, I won't take chances with shapes because, you know, if it's not a primitive, it's, it's difficult to achieve. Um, but I will take, I will take more liberties with, like, proportions and, um, and that helps me a lot, you know, like, I, and, or joints, you know, and then of course, if you, if you really want to go ahead and pose it a little bit and then you can cheat and, um, and I say cheat in the right way, you can cheat and get the, um, per the perspective down, you know, you can play with different camera angles and things like that, which is great. Good cheating, cheating that you get, I'm a huge proponent of if, if people think it's cheating and it's just about like art chops, like I, I got no, I'm not going to sit at that table. If you have a story to tell and your struggle is perspective or your struggle is um, me mechanisms or anything like that, but you really have a cool character idea and you can't get it down and you feel like your art chops are the thing that's holding you back and you don't cheat, you're, I, I feel like that's just awful. That's like the worst thing ever. Just cheat. Get the idea down. It's more important that the idea gets down than it is to have amazing art chops. Art chops are um, just make making ideas easier, but it doesn't mean it's necessary. And I think that's a lot where you see a lot of the uh, the Photoshop style, and that's just like very quick, and sometimes it's really quick, but it gets the idea down and. If that's, you know, and some of the ideas are amazing. And if I look at them and I think, like, if I sat down to render that the way I would normally render it, it takes so long and I'd never get the idea to the client, even though it was a really good idea. So then that idea would never get made. That's a shame. There's no way I'm going to condone that happening. myself wanting to like skip around but I think I'm gonna stick to this belly here real quick and just get it wrapped up so I don't have to worry about it anymore and sometimes like I know technically this belly is probably mostly in shadow um, but I want to bring I want to bring that form out so I'm gonna maintain it I'm gonna add a little bit of that highlight data in there just to just to maintain that shape then I know like all this right here is casting over this hip and then probably covering up most of that arm so like, again really important to try and figure out where your cast shadow is early on so you don't waste the time painting something and then just having to just cover it with a big shadow shape. I'm, the only reason I keep saying it is because I do it to myself all the time and I just don't want that for you guys. All right. So like here on this, uh, again, this is like another way, another um, area where like the shape of that hip um, is kind of ambiguous. So like if I go with kind of like round shading down here, like nice soft shading, um, it looks like the bottom edge of that just sort of rounds over. But if I then shrink my brush 
and I sharpen it, then all of a sudden it looks like it has like a nice facet where it looks like that plane changed to kind of match up with like where that um, the turn in that form is right there. So it's it is important to pay attention to like how you're shading just because you're using a soft brush and I just was just scaling the brush down I wasn't doing anything fancy um, and then I know that this arm is going to cast onto it so I'm just going to drop that shadow on now while we're here That, even that hip is creating a little bit of a shadow shape on that leg. And then that leg is casting onto the arm over here. So the arm is closer at the bottom, so it's going to be smaller. And then as the arm kind of shrinks and moves away, we're going to get further away. Oh, wrong button. So we're going to kind of boop, increase the brush size, get a softer transition down here, sharpen it up down here. And then that just gives the illusion. that that is moving away from that form. So we're just using the sharpness of the shadow to create as much of the distance and the shape of the form as possible. starting to come together. So we'll do the shoulder. So the shoulder, you know, overall, the shoulder is a sphere. So I'm going to grab everything that's kind of sphere shaped here and just render it all as one thing. And then we'll go back and kind of tweak it. But we can use our, you know, rendering a sphere is something that you kind of get used to doing. So we just kind of knock in and I reverse it back out. And it does like all the heavy lifting. And now just by casting some shadows, Can make it look like this one's hide that. This one's pretty far, you know, sticking out just a little bit. And then we'll go with these little screws and edit them up a little bit. What do you do when you need to erase in smaller shadow inside a big shape that you've already rendered with a soft shadow? Just start <laughs> that in. Yeah, that's the rub. Um, I will say, you know, um, if you're at a point, and I've been at this point many times, like right there, I just made a mistake. So maybe you aren't here for it. I use the smudge tool a lot. Sometimes you can repair things just by kind of smudging things around. Um, that's probably not what you're talking about. So I'll do a quick show of what you're talking about. So let's say, I'm gonna make two of these. So I'm gonna have two shadow shapes because what you're talking about is if you, you know, you render some, some awesome thing like here, like let's say you cast that shadow and then you render this sort of soft shape and they overlap, but they're both apparent at the same time. Well, now if you need to edit that at all, to, to tweak that is gonna be a total beast. So right now I have it set to multiply, but what you can do, and this is like, um, this is kind of like training reels and it doesn't matter like how old you are. It's like sometimes you're just doing something that's complicated and you need a little bit of flexibility. So instead of having just the layer be multiplied, 
you can do multiples inside of a group. Set the group to multiply. Set these to normal. And so then now I have that first shape on this fill layer. And on the second shape, I'll do the other shadow shape. And I'll do that. And I'll knock that in. And because they're both normal, and then inside the group, the group is telling it to use the multiply mode. And so it's multiplying everything cumulatively inside of it. So if I were to set it back, if I set the group to normal, you can see, well, it doesn't really look that much different because it's dark. But um, point is, this is editable. So now you can do like some shapes in this, some shapes here, and you can just keep adding these every single time you feel like there's going to be um, parts that could overlap and you may need to make an adjustment inside of like a larger shadow area. So, you know, have three, five, I don't care how many shadow layers you have. That just gives you the freedom to make some mistakes and not feel like um, you can't rectify them pretty quick. Hope that helps. That comes from experience. I, I have made that mistake many, many times and been very frustrated. And um, I get nervous about that stuff on big pieces, pieces that have a lot of shading going on. Um, because I know that designers are going to come and say like, oh, we changed the design. And then you're going to have to manipulate the thing. And if your shadows are indicating like, you know, some mechanical bit that they decided they didn't want anymore, then you basically do have to start over. So my process um, is very much about how to, um, hold on, my brush is acting up. Is, is being as flexible as possible. There we go, we're back. Um, I, I have to have that flexibility. Everything was, everything about my, about my techniques were derived from knowing that I was gonna probably be making a lot of changes. Arm or the backpack? Do the arm. That looks like we're almost done with the robot. I'm going to jump into the backpack and then start some of the surfacing. Yeah, yeah, I know. User error, user error is going to be the death of us. Every one of us is just gonna have so many like war stories about all the wrong things we did. How many times you painted on the wrong layer? You can lock layers, you can label layers. Doesn't matter. As, you can be as careful as you want, and it doesn't matter. You're still gonna paint on the wrong layer somehow. It's like the one time Photoshop allows you to do something that it normally wouldn't let you to do it. You do it. I think. I think Photoshop has some haunts to it because it always seems to allow me to do something that I wish I could do normally when I shouldn't be doing it. And again, I'm blaming a piece of software for something I'm doing wrong. All right, let's get a plane change going. So here I'm gonna I'm going to try and make this metal look like it has a little bit of an edge to it. So I'm going to put in just a tiny bit of shading. See, I just darkened it. So now you can kind of see the difference between the two of them. And now I'm going to go back and I'm going to reverse out and just put a little bit of a relief line in there. And there's, when you zoom out, it looks like there's an edge that it's catching. We can do the same thing over here to kind of keep it matching. And we'll do a lot more of this, like these little scratches and these rivets. It's 
so just to kind of like I could paint this one as a sphere but see how like I kind of like went a little like more planar at the bottom here that's just by kind of like keeping the brush a little bit smaller and it just kind of makes it look like there's a little bit uh, um, on the what do you call it knuckle here um, that it just kind of like bends maybe not quite so round it has some roundness to it it's not like a, a hard break but I like doing those I feel like they give it a little bit of character you look at a lot of automotive stuff like some of the best cars out there um, they have very subtle uh, changes in there in the in the forms and you don't notice them right away but you know those guys spend years developing those subtle bends and arguing over them go a long way looking for ways to cast a shadow sometimes these shadows don't really exist or they're a lot more subtle I look at like fuselages of planes a lot to kind of get inspiration as to like how to render some of the stuff the way that the wings attach to the fuselage is always really telling um, and sometimes the shadow that I like that I just drew in there just doesn't exist but I like it so I feel like it uh, it's like an artificial additive that I put in to kind of help really push the idea that there are forms laying on top of other forms. So we can do the we could do the knee a couple different ways. We could keep it round, which is like I think what I originally intended that it was kind of round. But then another way to do the um, sh the knee would be to just full on like put that plane in. Oh, that's the pen tool, which is completely not on purpose. Um, you, know, you can see the difference just between that kind of shadow shape and that shadow shape, and just how different it would kind of creates. I'm gonna I'm actually gonna stick with the plane. I think that looks pretty cool. And again these aren't like hard turns, they're just like these subtle turns, but they go a long way. They do the heavy lifting. Almost done doing the shadow stuff. I know you guys have seen a lot of this before. And we'll get into ways to kind of make some of the surfaces a little bit more interesting. All right, so we're gonna mimic that turn. And down here, we're just Knock that into shadow. Seems to work.
So this bag is going to be kind of interesting. We're going to have to because this. So we can imagine. We'll select all this area here. Actually, I'll show you. I'm just going to do this. I'm going to be really sloppy with the animal. Use the flat from the animal to remove that from the selection. Theoretically, there we go. So start with the shapes that are sort of easiest for you to figure out. And they sort of help guide the other forms. I know that this pocket's going to cast a shadow, and I know that the form is round, so I'm imagining like that shadow is ki kicking out that way. The ear is casting a shadow. So before I go rendering too much, and then these things are so much closer that they need a sharper shadow. I'm doing anything that doesn't make sense. It's pretty much usually the case. And, uh, sometimes you put in a lot of shadow shapes and they just become really busy and you have to go back and kind of edit them. I, I've kind of gotten better at that over the years, so a lot of times I'll, I'll put in a lot of shadow shapes initially, kind of doing all the light logic. And then I, I take kind of step back and it's just so busy, especially with the mechanical stuff. So then I go through, like, you know, I probably should have left that strap, but I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna exaggerate how big that head shadow is. So that it just, it starts to kind of like encapsulate a lot of those forms together. Um, and then some of these forms that are turning away from the light, just ever so slightly. I'm going to knock them down a little bit, like they're receiving a little bit of shadow. That calms them down a little. And then like this strut that's in the back, even though it's in, it's receiving light, I'm just going to, I'm just going to calm it down. I'm just going to not make it quite, not quite so heavy. So then the neck starts to kind of like pull together as more of a single shape. Those are just like personal choices. Whatever, if it if it feels busy, that's like a, it's a that's sort of my first go-to is like how do I remove some of these little shadow shapes? All right, we can do the animal, a little stuffed animal here. So for like this, these kind of like quilt work it's patched together if we ever so slightly like this purple here go across the bottom and just add like a little tiny shadow just makes it look like it's creased a little bit like the stitching is pulling it together you don't have to go crazy on something this scale but it you know, like this one again, just ever so slightly. And when we look back, it just, it kind of all of a sudden it feels like all those pieces are kind of like getting pulled together by the stitching and there's a, but there's a little bit of swelling going on.
so the end of his foot here. There's a couple options. We can leave it, you know, we could leave it flat. We could just ever so slightly give it a, a little bit of round, or we can make it really round, like it's like bulging like the rest of it, which I think is where I'm gonna go with this. And again, that's just the shadow telling it what it needs to do. Tricking our viewers. They like to be tricked. Do the side of this pocket over here. All right, that should get us pretty far with the rendering. Now we can start working on some of the surfacing. We might come back to some of the shadow shapes if they start showing that they're not quite as far along as we want them to be. It's also a nice part of using this kind of process where it's very modular, and editable, is knowing that you can always tweak it accordingly. All right, so save. Sean's asking me if it, or he's saying he's digging the difference between the distressed metal and the, and the inks. It's easy to make the worn materials look the same in the line work and the difference in the material is so well observed. Thanks, man. Yeah, so now, I don't think you were here when you saw, when you saw the, this is what the shadow data actually ends up on. So the line work really does fall away a lot, but it's still there, it's still supportive. Um, and now we can kind of choose our shadow color you can see just by using that white layer I'm really able to just concentrate on the shadows and now with that layer turned off I can now look at what the actual interaction looks like and we can play with the color and we have a lot of options that kind of again goes into the storytelling that we want to um, be using you could really high chroma shadows um, you know if, if they're standing out in sort of like um, this, you know, like a like a just a general daylight. We might have like kind of like a nice kind of grayed out blue shadow, um, and you know that that could work really well for this piece. Um, I tend to like kind of a purple shadow, just a smidge into the blue. Sometimes I walk it into the red a little bit, and then I'll just darken it just so it has the right mood. And I feel like I use the darkness of the shadow to kind of set the severity of the piece. Sometimes if I really want it. Um, to feel light and airy, then I won't go quite so dark. So we'll do that, and then we're going to add our uh, occluded shadows and core shadows just by adding a solid black above that. And we're going to link that down onto our shadow data. So for now, it just looks like complete garbage. It just dumps a black on top of everything, but we're going to invert that mask and um, we're going to lower the opacity in our brush so that we're not overdoing this but just we're gonna we're just looking for areas where there would be some sort of occluded light um, or you know crevices things like that Th this neck is is right for for areas where you know light has been bouncing around and those light rays just can't find their way back or way into these crevices no matter how hard they try so you're getting a little bit more occlusion in there and this goes, you know, this can get really busy as well. So I would be um, very careful not to go too far with it. But just finding those deep dark, you know, like where the pits are, where you really, really, really want to like 
make sure that it looks like no light is getting in. That's where, and then across some of these edges here of the shadows, where the shadows get cast, is uh, we use the same layer to kind of do our terminators. And it just, you can see, just kind of gives it a little bit more of a metallic look. It happens on people's faces as well. But um, a lot of this occluded light is especially apparent in old surfaces, areas where uh, it, materials that um, absorb a lot of light, dark materials. And I'm just kind of stippling it in and using a very, very low pressure and just sort of building it up because if you go full bore on this right away, it, can, it, it just gets out of hand really fast. So like on this on this sort of like thumb knuckle, if I just put this core across the edge here, just on the edge, it, it even kind of starts to look like reflected light, which is really nice. It kind of looks like the light ray is bouncing back up and it's, it's creating a little bit of a bounce light. So between the occlusion and some of those core lights, core, core shadows, um, kind of goes a long way to adding some of that that vibe that we need. So I didn't do very much, but I, I, I always kind of call it at some point because I feel like if it goes too far, it gets kind of kind of nuts. But I just feel like that grounds things nicely. And then I think um, I am going to use my sort of lighting sheet on this one that maybe some of you guys have seen before. So I'm going to duplicate the flats up above the shadow layer here. And I'm going to merge that down into a single group. And I will tell you one little thing about this, but um, so now uh, I'll throw that inside of its own group and I'm going to label that lighting. Could name that specular, could name it highlight, whatever you want. And I'm going to set the layer to add. And I'm going to take the shadow mask, add that to the group of the lighting group. And I'm going to invert it. So now because the color data is set to add, it's it's basically just like amplifying and brightening all of its um, all the the flats that are going on. But because I used the inverse of the shadow mask, it's hiding all that stuff. Um, so now we do we don't need this mask anymore down here. We're going to use this to start revealing our um, our highlights, but. You can see how bright, and this always happens in the brighter metals. Um, I'm going to use levels, and I'm just going to bring the lights down just a little bit. That's the wrong way to do that. I'm going to calm that down just a little bit because I don't need super bright highlights. I just need pretty bright highlights. And now I'll invert that so you can't see it anymore, but it's there for us. So if you turn the mask off, it's there. And now I'm going to start slowly introducing those shadows, uh, those highlights. So we know because the top of his head is sort of sphere shaped. And if you guys have, again, seen me do this before, I go pretty quick at first and just kind of like knock in my highlights. I don't care if they're very good. I just want to kind of get a general idea of where I'm going to be putting highlights. Kate's asking, got a drop, but I'm glad to able to watch. Oh, cool. Thank you very much, Kate. Some of these, I, you know, like the metals, I'm going to put some reflections in to start wiping in their highlights. And you can see that the yellow of the metal underneath, because I use the flats as my highlights, is creating kind of like this yellow highlight versus the green is getting more of a white highlight. And that's just because I am using um, that, the flats to get these highlight colors. So again, I'm just going to wipe in a few quick ones here to kind of give myself a little bit of a target, but we'll go back and really work these up and make them a bit nicer. So like for spheres, we got kind of like a round highlight. And we don't have any pure whites yet. So we always have that in our back pocket if we want to go that far. Um, 
and this is like a sphere elongated so you know the, the highlights gonna be like a long kind of ovally shape figure out where areas are catching light and so like this stuffed animal versus the leather versus the metal this is like a really so let's let's um I won't go through like the entire metal all at once but like let's let's work up these highlights where they're a little nicer so like for metal if it has some reflectivity to it it's gonna be really hot and it's gonna be sharper because it's gonna act more like a mirror. It's gonna like try and reflect back what is going on in the environment. So you might actually see like a mountain range um, in the actual reflection. But because this is um, kind of dull paint, now as the paint is hitting that surface, the little nooks and crannies and the discrepancies in the surface are causing those light rays to rather than reflect back to your eye in a precise way like a mirror does or like chrome does it's causing mo many of the light rays to kind of like get um, shot off in a slightly different distance so you're getting a general idea of what the reflection is but it's starting to become blurry so because he's painted metal and there's a lot of surfacing going on then we wouldn't see a sharp highlight and then to kind of um, push that a little bit further um, in the highlight layer for me what I like to really do is um, I like to go through and just destroy it a little bit and that is something you can do with different levels of opacity and I'm just sort of stippling and making like little random marks and you can even use noise brushes if you want to so if you have like cool brushes with like cool texture to them just kind of go back and forth with adding and subtracting that and then that highlight suddenly has a lot of little noise to it and there's a, just a bit more believability to how it reflects and we'll go back with just a little bit of hand painting and just oh, I lost all my pressure sensitivity how did I do that So we'll just stipple out. And I always like to put in a few by hand, kind of like really sell the idea that you know there's there's a little bit more of a deliberateness. And you look for these like scratches to catch highlights for you. Those are really nice. But that breaking up of that surface, that's what's happening. That's like what's really happening on these highlights is that they're just there's just no perfect surface for them to hit. So you can kind of just, you know, put a scratch right through it like that. And then when I zoom out, all of a sudden that reflection starts to have a lot more believability. It starts to match what you would imagine is going on with that surfacing. Versus this leather, the leather is also a really absorbent um, material. I'll go back to my soft brush here. Hopefully I have pressure sensitivity on it. Yep. Okay, so this one, the leather has like a little bit of an oil in it. So the highlight shape of leather tends to have, I'm sure you like, if you want to see like an extreme case of it, and you know, definitely put your safe browsing on. Look at like vinyl suits and things like that, or motorcycle suits, but vinyl, you know, is such a big deal right now. So there's like this, they're almost like designed beautiful shapes and then they'll you know kind of fade out but there's like this this glossiness to it so even though leather is distressed even though it has um, it's gonna have a lot of wear in it when we go back to it there's like these nice beautiful like almost like they sort of like flow with the shapes they sort of like fill them in with these um, 
interesting kind of like you know you see that little like rectangle that's sort of folding over there these triangles here I'm gonna put shape in and you can kind of wobble it a little bit to kind of get indicate that the leather isn't like perfectly flat um, so then once we have some of those knocked in because this is distressed leather now we take and we go back to some of our noise brushes uh, I can grab like this one that has some like scratches through it and I'll just start chewing into it. Oh, that's wrong. Chewing into it a little bit, breaking up that surface. Make some noise here. So the underlying shape is still like this nice kind of oily, clean shape, but then it gets broken by some of its little um, history marks. And so now even with that scratch I can go through and I can look at some of these hand painted scratch these little scratches that get put in and I can just just enhance those a little bit. Bring those up like they're catching light now. On the other side of that. If I'm in a jam, I'll I'll always rush through and just use some stamp brushes to kind of get some noise down. But I, I do recommend that like anytime you're using stamps um, to try and go back and do a little hand painting at the end and just really really put some soul back into those pieces, you know, because the, the stamps can become mechanical after a while. I fall prey to it. So you can see how the leather is starting to have like kind of like a glossy vibe to it. Um, and then for the animal, stuffed animal. Um, so a good way to start is either with a soft brush. I have this soft brush that has a little bit of a noise to it as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start over here and just kind of like start with this where it's like a little bit noisy. drop the opacity down and I'm just gonna slowly break that out we want this like kind of like um, sort of like fuzzy look to this thing so this is sort of the fuzzy stuff is a little bit more time-consuming but looks cool when it's done I think so you want to start with your highlight soften it as much as you want to and then go back in and sort of stipple back out areas that are not receiving any light and this stippling around the especially around the edges to kind of break it up is what's going to create the kind of velvety look Kind of vary the size. This thing's been around a little while, so we have the advantage of not having to be super precise. But just that stippling, and there's a you know, you can use stippling brushes as well to kind of add the noise. And then the last step is to go back and add a few, like almost like the reverse of the of the stippling back out using your soft brush and just kind of. carry that effect out. Didn't do it over here very well, but it should still work. And up close is always kind of a little bit misleading. And I think we're gonna come back and we're gonna hit this with a slightly brighter highlight after we tease this mask up a little bit. as it gets into the shadow shapes down here. It's kind of nice. And then when I pull out, it just has it just kind of looks like it starts to get fuzzy. 
and that just takes like I said it takes time kind of go back and forth and add subtract add subtract and just it really you know I, I do treat the shadows kind of the same um, you know as, as every other surface just because it's not as noticeable but in the highlights having that that surface distress that matches what that form actually um, is, you know, is made out of it goes a long way to sort of selling the idea. So using just a slightly different techniques for each one goes a long way. So the next thing, we just kind of like wrap up some of this metal. And just go back to what we were doing before where we just kind of, I say wreck it, but. Um, put the scratches in. It just goes a long way to tell him what's going on with this character, where it's been. Uh, often um, when we get into like organic characters, I do a lot of of the scales using this technique. So I'll, the highlights, I'll just put them in exactly like I did here and then I'll just wipe out the shadow areas of those scales. And sometimes you don't even need to do the scales in almost any other part just because it works so well. This is really dull down here, so I don't want to. I don't want to do any like really tight highlights. But I do want to distress it. So I'm seeing two areas that I messed up the shadow, like I didn't add the shadow in. Um, so like right here, I, I would imagine that the arm is casting a shadow, not only just on the top of the hip, but on the top of this ball that's rolling off the hip and a little bit on the leg, and as well as this fist would cast a shadow onto this leg. So I'm gonna go back to the shadow and I'm gonna show you like what happens when you make that kind of mistake here. So I'm just gonna turn the highlight layer off so we can see what we're doing real quick. So we'll go ahead and add that shadow back in, or not back in, but in for the first time that I wanted to have there. Um, cast the shadow from the thumb and the fist onto this kneecap and then from the fist. So those are things, you know, that's just like a, an example of stuff that I missed. Okay, so now we turn the highlight layer on, turn that back off. And you can see that the shadow and the highlight are now fighting. Well, we take this mask that we had originally, we put it back up on top of the lighting the new shadow one, invert it, and we're back in business. We're ready to go again. We just go back and just keep painting. And now that mask is updated. It matches the shadow data. And it wasn't such a big deal. Again, everything everything I'm trying to share is not like revolutionary. It's just it um, it comes down to a workflow that is uh, very modular and editable. Because I find like that was that was a big breakthrough for me because I got really precious and I would get very upset if I had to change something um, because a designer just changed his mind on the whim. Sometimes you know if a designer comes to you and they have a much much better idea. It's really easy to just make that change and not feel like it hurts your feelings. But sometimes designs 
are more arbitrary and sometimes they're very subjective. And so um, with a little change on a whiteboard somewhere in the office is, is kind of a big deal to your world. So it can get really frustrating. But if you work in such a way that you're not going to get frustrated, then you stay a much happier camper. So that's why I think it's important to share a lot of this stuff. Not because I think there are other techniques aren't equally as valuable or usable. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad it's approachable too. The, um, the, the more intuitive painting processes, um, and schoolism is full of artists that are just incredible draftsmen and they just, you know, they just know all of the, the light logics and they know their color palettes and it's really, it's difficult to, um, to make changes to. So I, I just, I don't, um, I don't often have, like in my personal work, I'll do it however I want, you know, I'll break rules all over the place. But with the stuff that I'm trying to, to show you guys is how to just how to stay sane in some of these production environments when when things are moving fast and you you're gonna get caught up doing more work than is necessary because your work isn't as editable and, and dynamic as it could have been I don't know I'd rather people make more art than worry about making changes to existing art I'm just going through and just doing like little details. You can overdo this as well. I often overdo it. You get caught up and you just kind of do too much. So to kind of wrap this guy up, there's two more things I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to do the light on his eyes, which will be next. And then I'm going to do some rim light and oh, I'll throw a background on him. And that should probably wrap this piece up. I would, I would think that that would be enough for most, um, most modelers or production artists that need it, something like this. Okay, so because I removed the mask from, um, from the shading, because I knew I was gonna do the lights slightly different, I'm gonna create just a, an, its own little group, just the, just the lights. I'm just gonna call that lights. Uh, and I'm gonna use the mask from the lights as that group's mask. And so everything I do inside of this, I don't have to worry about masking off the lights. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do is I wanna start with my, sh it's, it's not a shadow layer. I do do some shadows to, um, for all intents and purposes, but it's, I'll just show you. So with lights, as the glass turn, anytime glass turns away from the viewer, then the, the density of that, the thickness of that glass compounds and so it becomes more opaque. Um, so the most transparent part of the eye or the part of the, eye, part of the glass, if it's a dome, is gonna be the thing that's perfectly in front of you. And then as it moves away, it's gonna start to get darker. But that doesn't involve the reflections. That's just the, technically the shadow data. So do a multiply. And I just I just use the exact same color. We might adjust that in a second. All right, so as that glass moves away from us, it's starting to get more dense. Okay. And then same thing goes for these guys down here. As the glass moves away from us, it's getting a little thicker. We'll just imagine that this has a little bit of a dome shape as well for the sake of argument. I don't know what's going on with that. Oh, I know what's going on with that mask. Hold on a second. Oh no, so close. All right, we're in business. 
Sorry about that. Messed up my mask. Still messed up my mask. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay. And then, just as a little bit of a cheat, but um, I like to darken the top half. And that's like, uh, like I'm imagining like inside of that lens, there is like a continuous shape. Um, if it was a headlight, it would have like a, a, a convex dome uh, or a concave, you know, dome going inward. Um, and so there would be, as the light was kind of coming in towards it, inside of the form, I'm not shading the, I'm not shading the, the outside of the glass, I'm shading what's behind it it's kind of like it's the upside of it is not receiving as much light so darken that you, can, you just have to imagine it's like a tube that goes back and that will that will make more sense once we get the highlight on there so i think that that orange is okay but i'm gonna i'm gonna go a little bit more neutral with it and just a teeny bit darker teeny bit more red okay Casper's asking can you recommend a place to buy those scratch brushes I can't and the only and, and that sounds like such a cop-out because I know everybody just wants me to like give those brushes away but I can't I don't know where I got them I don't know who made them I didn't make them um, I've just had so many brushes for so long that I don't know I know I've even made brushes and I don't know which ones they are um, so Gumroad has tons of brushes. The noise brushes that I use, um, I have my go-tos. They're nothing special. They're just scratches. And if you just do a couple of YouTube tutorials, you can make these brushes really easily. You can just, you can even find the source online. You just find scratched metals and scratched papers and things like that and just make brushes out of them, make stamps and make yourself. And I actually have to go through and start editing down the number of brushes that I have because I don't use uh, sixty percent of these things at all um, I never finished my highlights on the head how did I do that hold on a second that won't take long and um, so yeah you, you're gonna have to search those out for yourself I, I really do wish I could just give them away but I am um, if, if there's a creator out there that made those brushes I do not want to be the guy that gives away someone else's work You know what, I think, uh, I remember right, I think the brushes, I think I bought a lot of brushes or not, or downloaded or wherever I got them, however I got them. Uh, DeviantArt, if you look up brushes, I believe, DeviantArt has a pretty good selection. Most people who make brushes are pretty cool, they, they give them away for free, they're not looking to capitalize too hard on them. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that sometimes brushes are made from other brushes, so there just becomes this sort of incestuous, sort of like non-origin story of each brush, so it's not worth trying to claim full ownership over it. But because of the photo chopping world, noise brushes are like, they're just everywhere. Um, People, people just make them, college kids make them and they, they give them away and they're you know, some of the best brushes out there. All right, we'll get back to the eye now.
All right, so next step on the eyes, we've got like our kind of shadow, con you know, converging form or diver diverging, whatever you want to say, like the forms are moving away from us. Uh, the next step is to, I'm going to add the glows. So I'm just going to use an add layer for that. And I could just sample this color. So I'm going to imagine that he has this center eye here. And I'm going to keep it blurry because I want it to look like the glass um, isn't quite perfect. So it's not, you know, it's not a super crisp eye here. Same thing with down here. And this is where I kind of use a little bit of perspective to kind of show, you know, like that the lights are deeper in. Which brushes are you talking about, Adam? The ones that I put up? Because I didn't make them for Procreate. They're only for Photoshop, uh, for Clip Studio. I don't know how that translates. Okay, so for that, that's the glow. So then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a reflection. So this is kind of fun. So we have to imagine what our sky color is, but for the most part, we can always adjust it later. Um, but we'll do kind of like a light blue, set that to add. And I'm just, I really only care about the top half because of the way I'm, what I'm about to do, but I just, I'm just gonna be really quick and dirty about this. Just gonna drop in that. And then the, I'm always focused on the hero light first. So I'm gonna mask this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a little mountain range in here. It could be a city, could be trees, just has to be kind of an ambiguous reflection. and. Um, I'm starting to get into some pieces where I'm actually hand painting the reflected sky on um, as a separate piece and then using that to reflect in. But for you know a subtle illustration like this, and you're going to see how subtle I'm going to keep it. It's not important, but you want to kind of keep the mountain ranges somewhat the same because they are reflecting the same mountain range or trees or whatever. And then. Slowly start knocking it back. Drop my opacity way down. We don't want a lot of this. Well, you want a lot of it if it's a very reflective glass, of course. Okay, so there's our reflection. And then the last thing is the highlight. Actually, there's, there's highlight and there's kind of like reflected light, but we'll do them both on the same layer. So again, I'm gonna set that to add, pick kind of like the brightest color. And these are, these are a little bit made up. Highlights on glass can be ultra specific. Of course, I just lost pressure sensitivity again. That's nice. Okay, Let's start over. So I like to I like to do just what I've been doing or I kind of go real crazy the highlight at first and then um, and then just sort of soften it down sometimes it's just on one side this is again this is more illustrative than it is realistic but I, I think it just kind of calms the forms down a little bit you can have like a you know, you've seen highlights in like balloon illustrations. Oh, all right, Jake, I'll see. There we go. Everybody feels calmer. Okay, so these little highlights, you don't really need to do anything to. Uh, but up here, like, you know, they could be square highlights, whatever, it doesn't matter. Because um, that really, you know, you've seen like a lot of pictures of people. It really depends on the, the actual light source, what that shape is. But this is what we're doing. It doesn't just want to indicate that there is a highlight and then using some of this darker color down here still on add I'm gonna just I'm gonna put a little bit of reflection going on down here I'm probably gonna adjust this color I don't like that very much but I like the shape of it so I'm just doing as if some of the light is hitting 
thickness of the glass down here and just eliminating some of that thickness. Carry that up a little bit. You see that on like camera lenses from time to time if you catch the light just right. Um, but like I said, I want to shift that a little bit so it's not quite so orange. as always I'm going to just knock it back a little bit so it's not quite so intense and to me like once you kind of just you know like when you're painting the reflections and you're painting the highlights and you're painting the you know the caught lights it doesn't um, it doesn't look correct but then you have to kind of zoom out and just kind of take a step back and all of a sudden it feels like glass and so for um, because we want these to feel illuminated I'm gonna go above the line work here uh, so the line is now at the bottom I'm gonna create a group called post which is usually where I put anything that I imagine is like glows and flares or whatever um, that doesn't want to be underneath the line work anymore so I'm gonna do keep this color nice and rich and deep um, and a nice soft brush and not too much opacity you want to bring these up slow but we're going to bring up the glow so it just gives off a little bit of light if you go too heavy with this it just blows everything out and just kind of ruins the illusion add a little bit of directionality to it So then the last thing we do, well, I, don't, I, would, I keep saying that. I'm gonna, so the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back into my shading group down here and I'm just gonna put um, a, some crazy color. Let's do, let's do a blue. That got caught in the wrong mask. So it's blue, I'm gonna set that to add. It might work. Might need to be a bit more purple for me, but we'll see. Okay, so this is gonna be my rim light. And again, we can adjust this after the fact. We just need to kind of start getting something down so we can see what it looks like. So the easy way to do the rim light is you just kind of go across your opposite edge from your light and you just sort of trace a very thin line. That's like the quick and dirty way of doing a rim light. And it works. Like that's already pretty cool looking. But because that's round, what it really needs to do is like let a little bit more light around that form. So any of these forms, you kind of think about like how much light coming from that angle could hit it. And sometimes that requires creating a selection. So this is, depending upon how much you, time you want to put into this part of it, this can be like a full on shading pass where you're basically creating another light source. It can cast shadows or you can just kind of keep it subtle like we're going to keep it and just kind of bring up that other edge so it feels like there's like a secondary light source that's just sort of influencing it a little bit so we know that this is round these are all round down here and just kind of calm those down Again, don't be afraid to put it in too heavy. Just pull it back out afterwards. So like on this kind of green dollop, it's gonna catch light again. So we'll select that green knuckle. So it kind of looks cool to have it, have that little extra hitch there. just calm it down a little bit and then as the form moves towards the light over here it's getting less and less reflected light it's 
little touches here. Kind of get that. Yeah. So we can kind of figure out what color we want that to be. Normally, you would actually look at your background color. But because it's my piece, I'm just going to do whatever I want it to be. Um, I do like the blue, but I think it has to be a lot less saturated. There we go. It's kind of like a white light. And then let's put a background on this guy. So I'm going to do what I like to do, which is kind of chop these out here. And as I'm kind of like hitting the finish line here, definitely let me know if you guys have any questions or you want me to change anything. We could put a, we could put a logo on this guy. So we know we have this color, so I'm going to start there. And then, you guys have seen me do this a million times, but just do a little steamy smoke in the background. Do I rotate my canvas? No, but I do zoom in and out. I don't rotate. I used to have a Cintiq, the smaller one. Right now I'm running the 24, I had the 20. And that was on the base, and you could swivel that. And I spent most of my time with that thing at an angle over it. Um, and then I got this big 24, and it has kickstands. It does. They do make a mount for it that allows you to rotate it. Um, but for whatever reason, I don't like rotating the the actual canvas. I like rotating the the device. And then so I think since I have this thing and it doesn't, and I never bought the the, the sort of rotation mount, um, I've just gotten used to not rotating it. How many layers do I have? Well, for the flats, it looks like uh, probably twenty. And then for shading, five-ish plus. Some of the lighting for the eyes, another five or 10. So total, maybe 30, 35 layers. I'm not gonna sit and count them. Everybody get mad at me. And then, anything else I can do to this thing? There's always something I can do to it. Sometimes I'll add a lens flare. Um, so for like, if you're gonna do a line, oh, we're, we'll color the line work, but for the post, for our, a lens flare, they're, they're pretty fun, so I kind of build them up with a few different um, different techniques. But you know, I'll start with like a deep orange, like that. I'll set that to add, and then we're gonna use the motion blur. Just stretch the crud out of it. Do like a J.J. Abrams style horizontal one. Yeah, the mount is ex is expensive. You like it because I um, I lay on my board. So John, do you do you have one? Oh, you do have one. I really messed up my shoulder trying to use it. Just <laughs> the legs. Yeah, I can imagine that absolutely. But um, what I ran into was that I lean on it, and I didn't feel like any of the mounts were strong enough to for the big one. And I had no problem with the twenty. The 20 was great because it had four legs and the swivel, and I could I could lay on the darn thing and it would be just fine. Um, but for the um, but for this one, it's slightly different. I think they expect you to get it into a um, like a visa mount or something. So we got the base here, and then so 
So I'm just sort of making like this cheesy. And then I'll blur that. So then just find a place for that that kind of gets hidden. And then you can duplicate it and put it on like other things, like a little bit smaller. Kind of like repeat it. And I wouldn't do those two as, as opaque, just like a little bit smaller. blur on it. Just having those like subtle things in the background go. Down. So Sean, do you are you running the twenty four or the twenty? Curious. I'm trying to think what else I can do to this thing. Let's put a logo on it. So let's pretend I just did it to myself. I'm going to go back to the flats and I'm going to put a logo. Do let's do one of those triangle logos. You get the 24 and you got the swivel mount and you don't feel like it bounces on you at all. losing my mind. You don't lean on it? Yeah, so that's my problem is I like, to, I, I think as I get tired, especially, I start really leaning on it. <laughs> But I think it's actually forced me to have some better habits because I'm, I'm drawing from my shoulder a little bit more, which my wife, who's a painter, is always on me about because I draw like I'm like four years old sitting on my uh, with a notepad. All right, so I'll take this guy. Chew that guy up. Sean, I gotta get a picture of your setup. I'd be really curious about it because I, if 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 you're leaning on it and you're not having any problems, that's that's hilarious. I, I definitely didn't get give it a fair shake then. Thanks, Connor. Thanks for showing up, man. I really appreciate it. All right, so I think that's gonna be it for this robot. But it's let's see, we've been doing going for about two hours now. Go for, you guys want to just sketch for a little bit, do a little drawing? Jump back to clip. I was working on the skull earlier as a warm up. Do something else. Alright, 
I'll draw for like half an hour or something like that. But if you guys have questions about any of the rendering stuff, actually, let me go back and make sure I saved it. Yep, I did. Good boy. All right. So I think I'm only going to do one drawing tonight. Normally I'll fill a page, but it's been. So as usual, I'm going to. I think I'm just gonna start with kind of like a random shape, just to kind of get the ball rolling. This is free sketching. I, you know, I don't really know what I'm drawing yet. And then I'll start with my block brush. And again, anybody who's new, these brushes are all up on Gumroad for free. They're just called demo brushes. You just follow the links and get to it. What am I making? Some sort of monster. found him. It's like that, uh, I don't know what it is, the, where you sort of see something in clouds. So you see it. Yeah, we can get into fur. I don't, um, I'll show you how I draw fur, but at the same time, uh, Aaron Blaze is a master at it. And if you haven't looked at his tutorials on how he renders fur, he is unbelievable at rendering fur. I learned a lot from his, and he has brushes for sale on 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 his shop on his site. all his fur brushes. I think I downloaded them. I haven't used them very much, but as soon as you see him render fur, you're going to want all his brushes regardless of if you ever use them or not. You just want to know that they're there waiting for you. Oh, you're talking about the fur brush that I used in the, are you talking about the one that I used in this, in the video that I did where I did the fur on, I think it was a jackalope or something like that, jackalope monster. Cause I'll show it to you. I'm not ready to part with it yet because I haven't f tweaked it enough to call it good enough yet. But is that what you're talking about? Oh, okay. Because I have a brush that I've been creating that does a lot of the heavy lifting for me. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm that guy. Yeah, when we get into organics, I think we can get into the fur a little bit. Just wanted to make sure that I was rendering a few different things that kind of correlated to each other. So fur on that robot would have been probably not super versatile.
I just hit, but it wasn't the right thing. Oh, my fingers are two two hotkeys over. <laughs> Furry robot sounds at you. Yeah, I think I, I think I could buy into a furry robot. What's happening? Hey, guess who's drawn on the wrong layer? <laughs> Jesus! You make one wrong hockey move, and all of a sudden, like you're just completely. Oh, out of whack. This funny thing happening. I don't know. If, I don't know if it's apparent on the stream. But the fluorescence in my Cintiq, I got hit by a lightning storm and um, blew up a bunch of stuff on my computer and um, just did little bits of damage to everything, nothing to keep me from stopping or having to buy new equipment. But now the fluorescence in the back, the backlit fluorescence on my Cintiq here, they flicker between cool and warm. And I think that they have, uh, I think that there's two sets in there. But so now, like as I'm drawing, it'll go warm, cool, warm, cool. <laughs> so, so when I'm checking my color, I gotta, I gotta bring it onto my good monitor. Make sure that I'm looking at it accurately. Yeah, I'm too cheap to replace this thing over something that just is like a minor inconvenience. But when I hit the big score, Daddy's gonna get himself a new Cintiq. That was a really scary moment. Shook the whole house. My computer just went black. Fried one of my hard drives, fried my network cable, uh, my network uh, card. Shut everything down. Oh, it's awful. But I'm back. Yeah, it's it's like losing your phone or like when your phone dies on you and all of a sudden you you just you just immediately realize how much work is ahead of you and how much it's going to cost you. You're just trying to mitigate costs, time. I don't know when it happened. I think it happened... <laughs> Beginning of the pandemic when everything else was happening. And so like, the nice thing about the pandemic happening was it just kind of made everything else be like, I don't, whatever, yeah, of course. Like, that's like the least of my problems is the fact that my computer just about blew up. Were you able to recover files? Um, yeah, you know, working at a video game company and working with Dave, who's like a, a nut for um, backups and things like that. But we've had, I've had a, a moment a million years ago now, but I had a moment where my hard drive at work, this is before I worked at Insomniac, long before that, um, my hard drive died and the company was not big enough where they had like a big server backup. And so 
everything that I had worked on for two years was just gone. So it was literally like I had not done any art for two years. It just vanished. And I, I was mortified. I was a lot younger then too, so that was like a huge, huge deal. Like I, I had no working files. I had the only files that I had were the files that ended up in the game. And that was like, the t at the time we were doing like 256 textures, all kinds of things. And so like nothing about what the final asset that was actually in the engine was was any you know any reasonable facsimile of of the work that I was you know the working file so it was it was it was incredible so from that point on I've always done backups I've always done like manual backups and then um, Dave who is notorious for being paranoid about that stuff in, in a good way um, hooked me up with a piece of software called vice versa and it basically is just a sync tool um, and it looks at drives and so every Monday I sync all my files uh, on a regular basis I've, I've been doing it for years it's part of my routine I know Monday morning I'm waking up and I know I'm doing a full sync of all my files and then I disconnect that drive from my computer and, uh, and they don't ever talk to each other except for on that one day and so if something happens to my computer I at least have um, a rest, something to restore from from pretty pretty recently if I do a ton of work like if I move a lot of video files or something like that I might back up even earlier but for the most part it's every Monday and at first it seems like a total pain in the nuts but after a while it just becomes second nature hard drives are dirt cheap I'm buying eight terabyte drives now for like a hundred and fifty bucks or something like that and you know I go through those like every six to eight months or something like that. So it's, you know, it, it's money, but it's to, that peace of mind to know that those drives are, are hanging on to, you know, so much data that I, if the house burned down, I could just grab them all and just run out the house and be up and running in no time. All the software is online now, so just buy a new computer, load up your files, um, and you're pretty much up and running as soon as you get your, your logins done. So there is some good news. Twelve hundred bucks. You want to hear something about that company I worked for? So I was more. I, oh, twelve hundred bucks is a lot of money. Obviously, I don't, I'm not making light of that. So the company I worked for was called the Collective. <laughs> Two years of my work, the, probably the most insulting thing that ever was said to me. Uh, it was five hundred dollars to recover my my files, and the owner said, "Nah, that's too much money. Two years of work, two years of my life, and five hundred bucks wasn't worth it enough for him to go and get the work." And I was just, I was dumbfounded, and he thought that because the work, most of the work was already in the uh, in the game. There was no reason to go back and get all the working files. We'd never need them again. Whoever makes changes, it constantly became a problem.
Sean, it was awesome having you, man. It was great talking with you. We'll have to definitely catch up sometime soon. Have an awesome night. seen Sean's work. He's awesome. Oh, that went a little quicker. What are we talking? 125? Oh, maybe we don't have time for another one tonight. We'll draw next week, too. Alright, is there any... Any last questions you guys want to hit before I take off tonight? Otherwise, I will bid you adieu. But I'm happy to stay and answer questions. I think my hand is just about to fall off. It's almost 2 o'clock in the morning here. Go like a little mole creature, huh? What's his name? How about that? You guys can help me name the guy. What's this little mole creature's name? <laughs> yeah, I gotta go to sleep soon. You want the robot on Gumroad? I need, uh, let me put that on my, I'm not going to do it tonight, but I will, I'll put the, I'll put him up. This is my to-do list notebook. Gumroad. Robot. So check for him. If anybody's interested, yeah, what I usually do is if, if there's a full rendered PSD, um, I will, um, I'll clean it up. I'll clean up the file. I'll make sure all the layers are named properly. And then I'll upload it to Gumroad and I put it up for five bucks. And so if you guys want to, um, you know, like dig through the layers and see how things are done, it's not rocket science, but at the same time, sometimes it's nice to actually have a reference file uh, that'll be there for you. So I'll put that up on Gumroad tomorrow if you guys want to check it out. Space Croc. Yeah, I can do that one too. So I'll do a space croc that I did. Uh, it was a time lapse. Like, I don't know how long ago it was now, probably four months ago. And I'll do the robot that I did tonight. Should be fine. Just takes me a little while to clean up the files because I don't want to put them up when they're a mess. Otherwise, it's not really worth your time. All right. So what do we got for names here? We got Horatio, Roger, Snap. I'm into FNAP. Horatio. All right, we'll go with Horatio. But FNAP is, let's say FNAP is the noise he makes when he's happy to see you. Horatio. And he says, That sounds like a win to me. Cool, guys. All right, well, I'm going to see if I can't find something soft to lay down on and wake up sometime tomorrow. But uh, I really, really appreciate the support, you guys coming out and hanging out with me. I said it before, but I'll say it every single week because it really does mean a lot to me to hang out with you guys and talk shop. It's, it's awesome. I love it. And I hope you guys keep coming up. Um, next stream, uh, we're going to do more rendering. Um, I'll probably start with a drawing again, um, maybe even flat it if it's simple enough. I don't want to, uh, if there's interesting flatting, I'll hold back on that, but it's going to be organic. Um, so we'll focus on some organic forms and figure out like, you know, like just ways to render that stuff as well. And we'll just kind of keep going through. And like I said last week, rendering is one of those things where it's like you're never done figuring that stuff out. 
so we can revisit stuff whatever all until we're blue in the face but for now mechanical snap saying uh, Horatio saying snap and it's been awesome thank you very much guys see you guys next week